Philadelphia Base Company, and I began starting doing research on the history of baseball uniforms around 1985-86. And by 1989, we then started doing it for Major League Baseball, and then we started doing it for the NBA, the NFL, and the NHL. So we've researched and remade about 4,000 historic uniforms. Uh, the most that we've ever made, though, has been in baseball. We probably have about 2,500 historic baseball uniforms for every team in baseball. And today, we're going to just focus on the Phillies. Uh, I thought you might find it a little bit interesting. Uh, the Phillies have an interesting uniform history, but a very, very conservative uniform history compared to other teams. Uh, the Chicago White Sox have the most uniform changes in the history of baseball, and that's mostly due to superstition. They're so bad, they change their uniform. <laughs> the Brooklyn Dodgers, for a long period of time, were doing that, too. A lot of people don't know they were green for a while instead of Brooklyn blue. But we'll start out with the Phillies uh, in 1883. This is the first year that the Phillies ever came into existence. Their inaugural year in 1883. And this uniform, this lace front P uniform, is what they wore. Now, they were called the Philadelphia Quakers back then. They weren't called the Philadelphia Phillies until around 1890. And uh, a guy named A.J. Reach, who was very famous, in fact, the American League Baseballs were, were under his name for quite a few years, he started the very first sporting goods company in Philadelphia that was in the USA, began here in Philadelphia. And this was a, a replica of what they wore. Now, is that wool? yes, this is wool. I was going, all these shirts are actually wool flannel. I brought one of my limited edition shirts that I make in a heavier wool flannel, and you can pass it around. This is really the weight of what they wore. The wool flannel that I use in all of these jerseys is a wool flannel that's a little more wearable and a little more breathable. If I were to make all of my jerseys in the exact weight that they actually wore in that period, nobody would wear them, nobody would have any, and I wouldn't be standing here with them. So I, I decided to use a blend of wool flannel that was used in the late 1960s through 1970 to make most of these jerseys. Uh, just as a little historic leeway or a segue onto wool flannel, wool flannel was used all the way through 1971 by the Philadelphia Phillies, all the way until Mike Schmidt came to the Phillies and Steve Carlton came to the Phillies in 1972. If they had come a year earlier, their uniforms would have been wool flannel. So wool flannel stayed a very traditional fabric. And the reason it was used is that unlike cotton, it wicked off the perspiration, and it wasn't as, as hot as people thought or as itchy as they thought. So it worked better than cotton. So in our research, we used wool flannels, and we used lightweight wool flannels as much as we could so people could actually wear some of the jerseys. So we'll move up here from 1883 into 1900. I don't know if you guys remember the uh, Philadelphia Magazine cover with Hunter Pence on it. He was wearing this 1900, uh, 1899 to 1900 Philadelphia jersey, and they started using the word Phil. Yeah, this is with a, a, a Byron collar, and this is their, their away shirt from that period of time. And they were starting to become Phillies. It's not really known how the name Phillies came about. Some people think A.J. Reach, because of his loyalty to Philly, used Phillies. Other people think that his partner owner, who was a horse lover, used the name Phillies because Phillies you know, is, a, is a, the, the name for the, the horses. And we're really not sure where it came from, but it began to be used around 1899 to 1900. So we'll move up to 1910. And in 1910, by that time, the Phillies were in the Baker Bowl, and the Baker Bowl seats and the stadium were green. So the owner of the Philadelphia Phillies in 1910 decided, wow. let's change the team color to green. And of course, he used this nice style of P, but for one year, one or two years, they were a, a, a style of green, just because it was the, the whim of the owner to be. And this is called, this is called a sun collar. And it was, it was worn for many, many years just to keep some of the sunburn off their necks while the players are standing around in the infield and outfield getting sunburn. Sun collars were very traditional. Now, we'll jump all the way to 1915. 
And I know there's a lot of Phillies historians here who know exactly what 1915 was about. Well, oh no, I'm going to go back. In night, oh, hello, Maggie. My grandniece is here. There's a few other people. I just want to say hi. Let's go back. This is outside, too. All right. In 1910, the Philadelphia Phillies were terrible. But the team that was really good in 1910 and won back to back World Series was the Philadelphia Athletics. So we had an American League team and a National League team. One of the things that I like to do, I'm a, I'm a Garmento guy, I like to recreate what was really worn during that period. So I brought, and you don't have to be delicate with this, this is the exact warm-up oh that the Philadelphia Athletics wore in 1910. This is what the entire team was photographed in. Now, in 1910, the Phillies meant nothing, but the Athletics meant everything. So I thought, even though it's a Phillies thing, you should see the Athletics. And you fit, yeah, the, now the elephant, in 1902, John McGraw, who was the owner-manager of, actually 1903, of the New York Giants, called Connie Mack's team a bunch of white elephants. And Connie Mack said, I'll show you, we'll make the elephant our logo. So he made the elephant his logo, and he proceeded to win back-to-back -back World Series, and, then, and, and also beat him again in the World Series. So this is, this is a, a four and a half pound. It's hand-knit by my knitter, Norma Riker, in Anson, Maine. And you can pass it around and feel it. They wore these all during the year. That was their warm-up, what, what you now know of today in the modern warm-up. This is what they did. So we're going to go, and we're going to move to 1915. I have to tell you, the Phillies had some of the most boring uniforms in the world. I mean, these, these plain peas lasted forever. And in 1915, the Phillies went to the World Series and lost to the Boston Red Sox. They had a pitcher on that team. What was his name? Babe Ruth. Oh, yeah, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. That's right. They had a pitcher on that team named Babe Ruth. But this is the uniform the Phillies wore in 1915 when they lost their first World Series win. Now, since I like sweaters and since I like what was the fashion of the time, this is the sweater that the Phillies wore all during the World oh Series gosh. in 1915. This is a four pounds so of heavy. heavyweight wool. This is their official sweater. You've seen photos? Yeah, there's photos. I'm sure your grandfather has photos of the players in this sweater. You can pass it around. It's a heavyweight, so heavy. great oh, long sweater. It's cold enough in the 2008 world. Great, great, great piece of items that they wore. I still make these today. I make these for certain people that like to have them. I, I don't want to tell you what the price of the sweater is. <laughs> I don't want to tell you. So don't ask. Don't ask. Okay. Now we're, we're going to jump from 1915 all the way to 1921. Most people think the Yankees are the only ones that were pinstripe. But 1921, 22, and 23, this, this was the Phillies uniform. Now, I don't actually know why. I tried to research it. I can't figure out why the P in the circle. But this was their style of uniform that they wore during that period. Old wool flannel, little sun collar, round P. Did right. they start then with the, the home home stripes and, and, and playing away then, or no? Home stripes and playing away was typical going all the way back to the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody was doing that. It was wearing a white or a pinstripe at home and a gray away. Mm -hmm. This, we move up to 1925, and this is, a, this is an interesting jersey in that the National League celebrated its 50th anniversary, its golden anniversary in 1925. So every team in the National League wore this patch. And I made the jersey just because I like it and because of the P I thought it was beautiful. But in historic research, like in, in uh, Mr. Murray's photos, what happens is a lot of times the patches will help identify the year. So we see a certain patch on a jersey, we know exactly what year that patch was worn and it helps identify historical photographs a lot of times. So this is a beautiful 1925 Phillies. Okay, we'll move quickly over here. This is an interesting jersey for one reason only. The Phillies stunk, it doesn't matter what their record was, but 1933 for away games is the first year the Phillies ever wore the word 
Phillies on their jersey. So this is the beginning of the Phillies. I see everybody's got Philly shirts on. This is where it all began in 1933 for just away games. This is what the Phillies wore. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a Chuck Klein jersey in 1933. And for the historians here, and I know there's a bunch because I can hear them talking, 1933 is a memorable year because something happened in 1933 that will never, ever happen again, I don't think. But the Triple Crown, are, are you all familiar with what the Triple Crown is? The Triple Crown is when a player wins the batting average. <laughs> a Triple Crown is when one player has the highest batting average, the highest RBIs, and hits the most home runs. He has all three of those records at the same time. It's very, very rare that it's happened. That just happened, was it last year or the year before? Year before. Okay. Okay. In 1933, we had an American League and a National League team in Philadelphia. We had two Triple Crown winners in 1933. In the American League, we had Jimmy Fox, and in the National League, we had Chuck Klein, and there they are. <laughs> that is a once-in-a-lifetime event that could have only happened in wow. Philadelphia, and I don't think it will ever happen. No, it could, I mean, it could happen it in California somewhere. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. So this was, a this was a Triple Crown winning Mike jersey, Trout, and the yes, beginning of the Phillies that you know. In 1934, the Phillies started wearing their Phillies at home and became a tradition for a little while in 1934. Okay, the next jersey I have is another 1936, 36 Phillies again. I only made, I make jerseys that I find are good looking and that are beautiful. 1936, the Phillies weren't that good. Chuck <laughs> Klein wore number 36. He was the real, the real Hall of Famer on the team. And so I decided to make it. You can see it has three quarter length sleeves. It has the old Phillies with no dots over the eyes. And every once, you'll, you may see Phillies vintage t-shirts that Mitchell Ness comes out with that, that uses these logos rather than the current logos in 1936. Okay, 1938 is an interesting year for the Phillies. They finally, in June of 1938, the Phillies got out of the Baker Bowl, which is a, if you ever go up Broad and Lehigh and you see that car wash up there on the left-hand side, that's the Baker Bowl. They finally, Connie Mack, he was in such, he was so broke and needed money, he finally rented Connie Mack Stadium or Shy Park to the Phillies. So in 1938, the Phillies moved out of the Baker Bowl into Connie Mack Stadium, and I'm I'm old enough to remember watching them there. <laughs> I saw the Philadelphia Eagles play there in 1957, so I, I go way back with, with the Eagles. My dad outfitted the Eagles and the Phillies. I, I grew up kind of in the Eagles locker room. Any, anyway, that's another story. So this is a this is a another Chuck Klein jersey. Now Morris Levin. I don't know if Morris is still here or not. He's one of my ex employees historians. Morris Levin wanted to remind everyone that the colors of this jersey, the the yellow and blue, were also the colors of Sweden because the Swedes settled along the Delaware River and on the Philadelphia perimeter for years and years. And the, color, the Philadelphia colors of the baby blue and yellow go all the way back to Sweden from Swedish settlers. And that's where the colors came this year from this jersey in 1938. 1942 was an interesting year. A terrible corrupt owner of the Phillies. Real dirt ball guy, <laughs> gambled. The, the baseball got rid of him in 1943 when Ruley Carpenter found. But anyway, anyway, this I only brought this jersey because they shortened the name in 1942 to the word Phils. Also, uh, my old company, uh, Mitchell and Ness, which began in 1904, we outfitted the Eagles, the Philadelphia Athletics and finally the Philadelphia Phillies. And this was the first year that my dad outfitted the Philadelphia Phillies. It was 1942. So it has a little you know, sentimental value to me. Every team in baseball in 1942 wore this because the health patch represented FDR's uh, plan for health and physical fitness. And in 1942, the health patch was the symbol of that, that FD, FDR was proposing. And, and being a champion of. So anytime you see a jersey, lots of times you'll see uh, uniforms and pictures with the health patch. It has to be only 1942. Yeah, no other year. And this is Jimmy Fox, who then actually came to the Phillies by then. Yeah. 
So we'll move up. I'm going to jump into the 40s. And I don't have one here, but I think there may be one in the store. This is 1948. Now, in 1948, Robin Roberts and Richie Ashburn were rookies. And in 2006 or 2005, the Phillies asked me, how, what Sunday uniform should we design and shall we have? And I said, how about using the 1948 home to honor Roberts and Ashburn? And that's what they did. And this is, and we made it for them. So this is the, this is the model and, the, and the, the mold for that Sunday uniform that you now see. Phillies losing all their baseball. <laughs> but it was their exact 1948. <laughs> they wore they wore this they wore this through 1949, and then in 1950, and I, again I don't know, but in 1950 they adopted this new uniform, and of course we all know what happened. At least they went to the World Series in 1950, and this is the first year. And this is Richie Ashburn's 1950. And something that the Phillies have done to this day on all of their uniforms, in 1950, they embroidered a third L on the uniform. There's always been three L's. So when it's, when it's closed, it looks like two. And when it's opened, it says Phil. So that was done in 1950. And the Phillies have kept that tradition in their new uniforms. The uniforms you see the Phillies wearing today began after 1991. This, this uniform lasted until they moved into Veterans Stadium in 1970. So this went from 1950 to 1970. Old Wolf, and this, this is the road uniform, just brought to show the home and road. You're a little far away, but the workmanship in these uniforms uh, that goes into these things, and uh, by the way, everything you see here is made in the USA. There's nothing in, in any of these uniforms that is, that is made anywhere else but in the USA, except for some of the slinky double nets. <laughs> these are all chain stitch embroidery. That are the, the numbers, the letters are all hand done. These are all done by little old ladies in St. Louis, Missouri, a company called the Levy Group to this day. And, the, and now they're Bosnians. Who are in there? Who have immigrated and who are doing who are doing sewing work for us in St. Louis, Missouri? So, this is really the the, the modern era. We'll we'll go to these classics that you guys probably remember. These jerseys were worn from 1970 until 1991, and arguably the Phillies were the most successful in these double-knit jerseys. The advent of double-knit modern jerseys happened in July of 1970 when the, the Pittsburgh Pirates opened Three River Stadium and they came out in double-knit uniforms. And for television purposes, they were very bright and very colorful for color TV. And that's how everything has evolved today into modern polyester and double knit. So I brought a Mike Schmidt. I brought a Steve Carlton. I love Steve Carlton. He was the nicest man in the world. People thought he was eccentric, but he was really nice. He was very, very nice. And of course, a Tug McGraw. And these are, these are Phillies jerseys that they wore all the way through from 1970 all the way through to 1990, through 1991. Um, this jersey was worn in 1979 for one game. Larry Christensen was the pitcher. I think they were playing the Expos in Montreal. I don't think it was here at the Bet. And they wore this maroon uniform for one Saturday night game. And everybody complained about it. TV hated it. And it lasted only one game ever in 1979. It was the Phillies uniform. For some reason, in 1979, there was a tour of Japan that famous baseball, all the, the uh, all-star players went to the tour of Japan, and Mike Schmidt wore this uniform in Japan in November of 1979 also. But it's a very rare uniform, and not many people see it or remember it, so I thought I would show it to you. And of course, the team that we know and love today 
I had to bring Mitch Williams. <laughs> and you'll see, yeah, you will see there's a third L. They still do the tradition of the L in the uniform. Who else did I bring? Oh, this is an older Schmidt. This is another Schmidt uniform I just forgot to tell you about. All-Star game from 1989 in the gray collar. And it had to end with Lenny Dykstra. <laughs> this is one of the BPs that they wear to, in, uh, that they wore in, in the 90s. We played with them through 1996. So that's about it. That's a little history of the uniform. I hope you uh, enjoyed a little bit of the history of the uniform.